Those of us who have grown up in New Orleans and many all over the world are familiar with the city as the birthplace of jazz. I've lived here almost all of my life, and um, when I met Shane Leaf, I was kind of dumbfounded to learn that he was studying the contribution of d indigenous people to the formation of jazz. And, I, and it, um, my jaw kind of dropped because I thought I'd never heard that after this whole life of learning from this place. Um, Shane and Jeffrey Derensburg are here to share with us thoughts on the soundscape of New Orleans. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful. Shane is also one of our um, Monroe Fellows at the Center for the Gulf South. And it's extremely rare that a graduate student receives one of these research fellowships, but he did because our committee was so um, riveted by his methodology and, and, um, and our own awareness of, of uh, this blind spot of ours. I'm gonna read biographies of, of both of these gentlemen. Shane Leaf was born and raised in New Orleans. He has played music since childhood, leading percussion bands during Mardi Gras for the past two decades. He has MA degrees in linguistics and musicology, focusing on the history of Congo Square in New Orleans. And he is currently completing a PhD in the interdisciplinary program in linguistics at Tulane University. Jeffrey Derensburg was born and raised in Baton Rouge and graduated from Baton Rouge High School. He earned his PhD from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. His family is from Point Coupe Parish, and he lived in Lafayette, where he was a computer and research professional. He's now in New Orleans and is a teacher, and I'm grateful to Shane for introducing us. I hope that there are many new relationships and friendships that come out of this day. So um, Shane is gonna speak first, followed by Jeffrey, and then Laura is gonna lead a, a Q&A with, with Liz and, and the two of them. Thank you so much. It's great to see everybody here today. Uh, in a few short minutes, I'm going to try to give you a glimpse of uh, an aspect of the history of the region, which I have to say, frankly, um, it's astounding. It's, it's, it's shameful and astounding that it's been so neglected. Uh, in fact, when you look at music history as the way it's taught in North America, usually Native Americans are considered to be, uh, it's a whole phenomenon of music that has went away somehow like the people themselves. The same goes with New Orleans too. So I'm, I'm, I continue to be amazed that up until now, it, it took the tricentennial for people to start realizing, well, wait a minute, there, there are other people as well you know, who came before. So um, I really appreciated the series of maps that we just saw Elizabeth Ellis was sharing with us and uh, this particular engraving from uh, 1720, I think it illustrates the, the bizarre nature of some of the imaginings and the perceptions of the Europeans. And uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do is really ask these kinds of questions about, well, what kind of music was being played and how did this impact uh, New Orleans in particular? That's my interest. And um, as far as jazz goes, well, that's a long story. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't make any specific uh, lines of, of uh, you know, connection there, but I would say that there is the, the continuing practice of Native American music. And uh, so uh, today we will look at just a couple of uh, elements of that. Okay. Uh, of course, we've inherited ways of thinking and speaking. So uh, as someone who focuses on languages, I, I'm always paying attention, careful attention to the words that are being used. And even though I think that universities are very good at accumulating knowledge, usually there's, uh, it's attended by an illusion of insight. So we have to be careful about how we interpret everything. Because even if we have these wonderful tools of science, I know that John Barbary, just a moment ago, uh, in, in their talk, he said that, uh, Without science, you know, I, I mean, we have science, but without consultation with the people, what does it mean? So I really feel that we get kind of spellbound by the tools that we have, and we really have to think about, well, what, what does it mean to all of us and, and, and various meanings? So I love uh, what Patricia Galloway says, is that when we produce narratives from these colonial materials, such as the ones that I use, uh, it's tantamount to the effort to wring blood from the stones of European incomprehension and representation of Native American, uh, Native behavior and testimony. So it, this is how difficult it is, but we have to try to restore the context. Uh, one bit of the colonial record is the Histoire uh, by Le Page de Prats, 1758, 40 years 
after uh, he was here during the establishment of New Orleans. And uh, what I did was I wanted to take a look at this particular document and a description of a, a very important ceremony. Uh, and this was uh, the March of the Calumet, or the Peace Pipe Ceremony. And this took place in 1718, uh, after years of conflict between the French and the Chirimacha, and, uh, and the mass enslavement of the Chirimacha as well. And uh, I would, had been curious for years, well, what does this woodcut really mean? What does it really refer to? Uh, and you, you can see at the very top there, there's a, there's a structure where presumably um, the Page de Platz and other French uh, colonials are, are observing the proceedings. And uh, at the very head of the line is uh, one of the dancers with a calumet with uh, a long stem. And uh, you, ha you see that the, f the feathers that are coming from the stem as well of the pipe. So this really is truly the first organized musical performance that we know of that was recorded in New Orleans after it was established. So I figured, well, this is pretty important to take a look at. Um, now, the Calumet Ceremony, we have to keep, keep in mind that this is a French word that was applied to native practices. And it has a lot of different possible meanings. Uh, so the Calumet often refers to the, the it's the uh, long stem, the, the reed stem of the, the pipe that's fitted into the pipe bowl, but uh, it's also related to uh, uh, chalumeau. So this is uh, actually a, a, an instrument in the late 1600s that was a predecessor to the clarinet. And uh, also, as it turns out, when you look at ecclesiastical history, the chalumeau is also uh, a, like a straw that's used during ceremonies from the 9th to the 15th centuries in, uh, in communion with the Eucharist. So uh, this is something that was used during coronation ceremonies with the French king. And, and, and today, the, the pope uses something like this as part of these ceremonies. So there's this other layer of French or European ecclesiastical interpretation that's being superimposed on what they're experiencing. Um, but the actions of the peace pipe ceremony, we have to keep in mind that across the whole eastern, uh, what is now the United States, North America, uh, this was part of a, a, a whole system of smoking tobacco, uh, and some, it had took many different forms regionally. So it, it turns out that in some cases, let's say uh, uh, in the Great Plains, you might have medicine bundles where the pipe is buried with the medicine bundle. This doesn't happen in other areas necessarily. Uh, it, has, it involves a lot of different activities, exchanging gifts. And again, as Elizabeth Ellis was pointing out, there's a diplomatic missions that were happening, and this is a very uh, a key role or key function in the diplomatic uh, ceremony. Uh, giving speeches, playing percussion instruments, uh, and very importantly as well, is extremely intimate. So people would rub their bodies, they'd rub each other, and they'd be crying, they'd take their tears and rub it on each other's bodies. So this was, I, I, it is a, a very important point of contact. It's an actual thing that people were, were doing together and became part of all of these other patterns of interaction, but it's a very key moment. Um, so we want to look at the different implications of this. Um, so in the Histoire, uh, there, are, there were parts that I discovered that had not been translated, at least in a lot of the English versions that had been reprinted for decades and decades. Uh, so I found a couple of uh, details. Some of them had been published and others had not. And uh, so here, Le Page de Prats is explaining, well, we were, he was with Bienville when the Chirimacha came in their pirogues, in their boats, and they, they were singing the Calumet, uh, which they took in the air and they shook in rhythm uh, they shook in the air in rhythm, and they were, they were holding it like this, and you have to keep in mind, if they're doing this, the pipe itself is a participant. It's, it's something else. The pipe itself is dancing. So all of these things, which maybe the French may or may not have been aware of, certainly there are other layers of meaning that they, have, they may have missed. Um, and on these occasions, they never fail to have a shishiqua. So the shishiqua is a rattle, and it sounds like what it, the sound that it makes, shishiqua, shishiqua, shishiqua. All right, so the sound, it's really neat because if you hear that and you make that sound, you actually are recreating the exact sounds. You know, that a human being, in fact, the, the shishiqua, it's like the instrument that's kind of naming itself. It's announcing its own existence and what it does. Uh, so they were using the shishiqua. Uh, Bienville responded in a, with a few words in what, they, what he calls uh, the langue vulgaire. So this most likely refers to mobilian jargon. Okay, well, what is important about this? Uh, Mobilian jargon was a trade language uh, that was spoken all throughout what later became the southeastern United States by various indigenous groups and people of African and European descent. Uh, but it also had many different names because the French, uh, the colonial narratives 
were only piecemeal understanding what it was that they were hearing. So sometimes they have, uh, you know, lang, uh, chikasha or lang vulgaire, uh, and then nowadays, sometimes I hear friends of mine refer to Choctaw trade language. So there's many, many different names that it goes by. Uh, but it's, you know, part of, a, 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 again, a, a system of a language of intercommunication. And we can call it a trade language. Uh, some people contend that this was actually an ancient ceremonial language that predates the European incursions by many centuries. So that's possible, too. Um, now, in terms of, of the Calumet and understanding how it worked, a lot of these French soldiers uh, and, and French uh, Jesuit missionaries, they would uh, learn very quickly that it could be used to stave off attacks, and it could, it could indeed be a sign of peace. Um, and uh, back in 1700, uh, Father Paul de Joux, uh says, we are living with the Natchez as brothers. Okay, well, little did he know <laughs> what was gonna happen because as we just learned from Elizabeth Ellis, uh, there was this uh, uh, attack and destruction of Fort Rosalie. And so, uh, but up until that point, some of the French commanders and the soldiers, the governors, were misunderstanding. They, they had strange expectations of what the Calumet was, and in some cases, they completely ignored it. So uh, Governor Cadillac, he, he went up to the Illinois country and was completely ignoring what he had to do in terms of going and meeting all these different groups. And uh, there are many occasions where the French were impatient, and they didn't want to spend the three or four days with the, the elaborate ceremonies and the rituals of speeches they just wanted to cut through to the chase, I guess, you know, with what, whatever imperial designs they had. So we have to keep in mind that this was happening, that they were misunderstanding or mis, uh, their expectations, their mis-expectations <laughs> of what was happening. Um, now, another little instance, because I have so little time, uh, is when Father Charlevoix was coming down the Mississippi in 1722, and he hears a drum. And he hears someone, he, he hears this drum beating, and he's well, what is this? And he, he's curious, and he goes and he talks to the person who's playing the drum, who's with Aklapisa, and uh, this, the drummer says, well, you know, actually, it's not an ancient tradition. It's something that one of you guys gave to us last year, okay? So very fascinating. Okay, well, there's an exchange happening in 1722 with musical instruments. Um, now, looking at the text very carefully, uh, we can observe that even though Charlevoix uses tambour, he also says, kes which is cognate with kaisha, a kacha, or a snare drum. Now, I propose, well, is it possible that it was a snare drum that he had given to the Aklapisa? Quite possibly. After all, many, many, many years later, when people are recognizing the connections between Aklapisa and Choctaw, the Choctaw are uh, unique in the area for having a snare drum, okay? One that they make themselves, but also European drums that were borrowed or, or manufactured at some point over the centuries. So, uh, like I say here, by the early 1800s, the Choctaw were playing a snare drum. So it stands to reason, well, was this, in 1722, such an early instance of a European instrument being borrowed by Na Native Americans? It's quite possible. Um, now, and here we get to uh, what happened in Natchez. Uh, there are, there's an a delegation from the Illinois country, many different groups in Michigamia, the Kaskaskia, they come, and they come to the church, and there's a, an incredible moment where you have Ursuline nuns singing in Latin, a Gregorian chant, and uh, all these different uh, members of the Illinois Confederation singing uh, the same melody, but in their own language. So there is a kind of an antiphony that's happening at this uh, early date. So a lot of things are happening in terms of exchange, things that maybe are different from our preconceptions. So some open questions that I'd like to raise is, indeed, what are we trying to learn? What are we looking for with all these cultural interactions? Uh, how are preconceptions changed or challenged by all of this? And uh, how have these encounters impacted music in New Orleans? I mean, clearly, if it, not only in the early days, but all throughout the time of New Orleans, you still had delegations coming in with processions, it stands to reason that there would be a lot of impact. And how does this uh, series of interactions like the Calumet Ceremony impact our understanding of Louisiana and all the people who have lived here, the possibilities of interaction? And uh, with that, I think I'll have to conclude. So. <laughs> Good morning, and I'm Jeffrey Derensberg. I'm a tribal council person and head of the alligator clan of the Atakapa Ishak Nation. We are an Indian nation from southwest Louisiana and southeastern Texas. On many French maps, we are referred to as Indian Errant et Anthropophage. Uh, that's because uh, someone asked some Choctaw people who lives west of them, and they said, oh, a bunch of Hatak Apa, which means a bunch of man eaters. Uh, I sat next to a Choctaw man. Uh, right there who is a graduate student here just now and he can t testify that I did not try to eat him yet. Um, 
But our own name for ourselves is Ishak, which just means the human beings, which is what many tribal names mean. So i um, happy to be here today. Uh, Professor Ellis gave an excellent talk, one of the best talks I've seen on that. But you cut off part of this picture, and the best part, because this is a photo of, uh, or not a photo, it's a watercolor by Alexandre de Batz, Dessin de Sauvage de Plusieurs Nations, mais je apologies pour parler anglais aujourd'hui. Um, Mes amis Francaises. Um, the, these are a bunch of people visiting New Orleans in 1735. What's interesting is none of these people are from places near New Orleans. None of them. These are native people from Illinois and Iowa on this side, but over there is someone from southwest Louisiana or southeastern Texas, uh, and he is labeled Atakapa. He is a cousin of mine. Um, a wee pen, as we call him in our language, but when we're speaking of our language, I want to wish you a happy big French day because we have so many French visitors. The word for New Year in our language is Nakit Kiwilsh Yi Hakwe Tosh Hakokino, and that means Big French Day. So when we say Happy New Year, that's what we say, but that speaks to something in native culture that our measurements of time are not always the same as Europeans. So when we approach the tricentennial, we must remember that a tricentennial is an utterly insignificant period of time when you're talking about native nations. When they had the sesquicentennial recently of the colonial occupation known as Canada, I saw this wonderful photo that an Ojibwe woman had put on her Facebook page, and I think it speaks exactly to my attitudes towards the tricentennial. It is kind of a tiny period of time. But if we wish to celebrate 300 years of friendship between the French and my nation, I wish to say I am very happy to do that. Uh, my, all four of my grandparents grew up speaking French, um, whereas I speak, uh, as my grandfather said, uh, lousy French and also pretty bad English. Um, all right. Let's talk a little bit more about language. One of the terms that is recorded for New Orleans, and really for the lower Mississippi Valley pre-colonial, is this term bulbancha or balbancha. It's spelled many different ways. But it means a place of foreign tongues, the place where many languages are spoken. It speaks to an area of interaction between people of different cultures, all right? Not a monoculture, a place where cultures meet. Many languages spoken there. So, when we are talking about New Orleans, one thing I like to think about is that even before the colonial contact, we're talking about a place where cultures interact. And it's also a place where native people have formed the basis for much of that interaction. Whereas, unfortunately, when I hear accounts of the history of New Orleans, I all too rarely hear accounts of native people in New Orleans whether we are talking about music, as Shane Leaf uh, talked about, or about food or anything else. It is a cosmopolitan place, and yet when we talk about some of the most important places here, we're talking about the places in New Orleans that make New Orleans, the places that cause New Orleans to be what it is. We often do not hear enough of the native story. Let's talk about Congo Square. We cannot talk about jazz music without talking about this place in New Orleans, this place of African dance, supposedly, and African music, which it definitely was. But even the sign when you go to visit the place says that it was a native dancing ground first, and those native people didn't just disappear. It's not like they just vanished. So there was interaction, but that story is not the story that is told. There's a popular radio program here called Sounds of Congo Square, I listened to it a good bit. I've yet to hear native music on it. But surely there were some native sounds in Congo Square. What is that story? If we talk about religious folkways uh, in New Orleans, one of the most important parishes is St. Augustine Parish in the Treme. Um, some of you might visit there. That parish is a, the first parish outside of the city walls that were constructed. It's a parish associated with free people of color, including many famous free people of color, many famous um, families that were involved in jazz music. Sidney Bechet, some of you I'm sure into jazz have heard of him. He was baptized at that church. There is a memorial there called the Memorial to the Unknown Slave. Many un enslaved persons are buried on that property. And when people speak of this church, they are always speaking about African slaves. 
But even the sign next to the church itself says that they found also native slaves there. So the church seems to have had an association with both native people and African people. What is that story and why is it not told? A conversation needs to be, be begun with that. When we think about native people in New Orleans, we might think about people just as in the Debats painting that I showed you, people passing through, selling things. This is a, a drawing from 1875 of the French market in New Orleans, a copy of the drawing hens in the French market, and the French market still kind of looks like this. You can still see areas like that where people are still selling things. Here they're selling sassafras leaves that are used uh, to make a spice called filet. And yet, if we're only looking for native people like this, native people who look like movie Indians, like I like to say, we are obscuring the fact that there are other native people in New Orleans, people who have been here for a very long time and have continued to make New Orleans, not only visitors to New Orleans, but the very core of what we call the culture of New Orleans itself. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about Louisiana's Creole population. Creole is a term for an ethnic group, but like many other ethnic terms, it can obscure an ethnicity rather than displaying it. Terms such as Puerto Rican or Latino can often obscure the native roots of the people. I'm a soccer coach here in New Orleans. Some of my kids that I coach are of Maya ancestry. They're 100% of Maya ancestry. People think of them Latino. That tells you nothing about their ancestry, all right? Similarly, Andrew Jolivet, who is a member of my nation and a professor at San Francisco State University, did a landmark series of surveys of Louisiana Creole population in which he found that many of them know that they have tribal ancestry, in fact, can point to it genealogically, even carry forth tribal traditions, and in some cases are even members of tribal nations. I am one such person. If someone were to ask me what's the difference between myself and an Ishak from 500 years ago, I would say this. Well, if you ask my Ishak ancestors 500 years ago who they were, they'd say they were Ishak. And they'd say, why do you call yourselves Ishak? And they would say, because my ancestors did. Well, that's the same reason I call myself Ishak now. There's zero difference between me and those people 500 years ago in that regard. I am descended from those people who've lived here for the past four and a half thousand years. They were descended from them. We are equally Ishak. Native culture can change over time. It doesn't have to remain static. When we think of French culture, I'm thinking of castles. I'm also thinking about modern steel and glass buildings that I've seen in Paris. They're both equally French. French people have a right to change over time, and so do we. However, one thing I would like to point out is that often, as has been pointed out by Jack Forbes, one of the greatest scholars of this issue, whenever a native culture, or sorry, excuse me, whenever African culture interacts with another culture, we tend to just see it as African because of the racist notion in the United States that a single drop of African blood is a contaminant and obscures everything else. I have African ancestry. There's nothing wrong with that because black is beautiful. But if one were to only call me black or anyone else of mixed ancestry who is African American, you're obscuring something. So we think of Tiger Woods as a great African-American golfer, not a great Asian-American golfer. He had one Asian parent. Barack Obama, yes, is the first black president, but also the 44th white president. He had one white parent. Crispus Attucks, the first person killed in the American Revolutionary War on the American side, had a native mother, an African-American father, but we never really think about the fact that he's also native. So in conclusion, I want to look, show you some photographs. I'm very attached to these photographs. Look at them, what ethnicity are they? They're native people. They're native people in Louisiana. I love these native people. Uh, I have to tell you that one of those people is my grandfather and the other one is his mother. So you can have people who look like this in Louisiana. And then when we look at their records though, of someone who's descended from them. I want to call your attention to something. It says both parents are Negro. Does that sound strange for you? Well, that's my birth certificate from 1972. So if you're looking at records in Louisiana, those records which are often contrived by white people with their categories can obscure what the actual ethnicity is. The story of native people in New Orleans will begin to be told correctly when we tell the story of all the mixed people and our culture that we have brought to New Orleans over time and how that influences us. All of the things in this photo are in some way native. Crawfish, native food, corn, native, all right? They didn't come from France, they didn't come from Spain. Zydeco music, filet, all of these things are native. And so I hope to begin a conversation with you, or at least I hope people will think about more 
about the native aspects of New Orleans and Louisiana culture and carry that forward, realizing that native people are not stuck in a photograph. We exist here and now. Thank you.